So this is the machine learning course, by the way, are the team. Hey, where'd it happen to the, how to refresh this, I suppose. Yeah, the team won very well at the penetration testing competition. And um, they made second place right behind Stanford, which is very good. Um, they are not proceeding to the nationals because they didn't get first place and some other people got these so-called wild card slots. But anyway, it's the best we've ever done. And so the, they did very well. And uh, they want to do CCDC, which is the defense competition. Any of you can join. Click this link and sign up now if you want to participate. Um, this will happen in two weeks. There'll be an invitational, and then there'll be something called a qualifier after that. There's a series of these events, and, and they're very. both of these are extremely good for students to have to find jobs. Um, all right. And the good thing about CCDC is the invitational has no requirements. You do not need to full -time, be a full-time student or taking any particular class or anything. Um, because it doesn't really count towards winning prizes. It's just a practice round, and therefore everybody can participate. And uh, the details aren't clear yet, but I think what will happen is it'll be face-to-face -face in the science building. I'll be there, um, and we'll have a bunch of students. You, you sort of work all day defending networks from attackers, the attackers being Caitlin in this case. So you will have the honor of getting hacked by Caitlin. Um, she's running the red team for this, or running some part of the red team, and I think uh, a lot of it. So anyway, um, all right, so here we are with machine learning security. Oh, I should also mention other events coming up. Um, there's a whole lot of guest lectures and events coming up in a couple of weeks here. Um, let me get to the right page. All right. Uh, right, so uh, on November 28th, Caitlin will talk about red uh, radio frequency for red teamers, and the next day, Kaz, another one of my ex-students who is also a professional penetration tester, will talk about Kubernetes for hackers. Then we have the Invitational December 2, Pacific, Hack Pacific Hackers Conference happens the same day, and you can get in free by volunteering if you want to. Uh, there's a Girls Can Hack, and I uh, thought there was more stuff coming up, but anyway, that's, that's stuff, there's a lot of that, that's enough. The, the CCDC, right, all right, anyway. So let's see, I see some questions. How much experience should you have to sign up for something like CCC? Uh, for CCDC, you don't really need any at all, certainly for the Invitational. You can just show up and, and try to watch and help, uh, and that's a good way to get started. Um, there are many different jobs involved. There are even non-technical jobs involved. But what you have is you have a network of like eight computers, and you have to defend them. They're from Windows servers, Linux servers. You have a firewall. And you also have a injects, which are management making requests, which you have to fulfill. So there's just sort of some business scheduling and business communication going on. Um, need and I survived being hacked by Caitlin. Yes, that's a good idea, <laughs> Jordan. Yes, we should have that. All right. Anyway, so uh, all right. So this is the machine learning course. And I'm trying to get to the schedule. All right. So we're nearly done with this course. The whole semester is nearly over. With the holidays, there's not much that happens. And here I had to cancel two classes because no, uh, next week is Thanksgiving and the week after that is CCDC. So uh, we'll cover this chapter 12 and all there's going to be is uh, chapter 13 and the last day. That's as far as we're going to get. So that's what I propose to do is to talk about the custom models today and the pre-processing data tomorrow. And that's as much as we're going to cover in this version of this course, which I must say I found very interesting. I'm very pleased with this book and the information in it. All right, so I don't have a new project today. As I said, we, uh, this stuff we were talking about, we've actually already done quite a bit of it in earlier projects. We just didn't have like detailed explanations of it, which came later, which by the way, I think is a good way to teach. First you do something and make it work so people care. Then you talk about the details later. That, that's a good way to get going. All right, so. Um, we're going to talk about TensorFlow and compare it to NumPy, and then custom models, functions, and graphs. So TensorFlow is the library we've been using for almost everything. Um, oh, good. All right. Uh, Keras is the high-level API, which is what we used for almost all the models we've made. This is the easy model, the easy way to do it. We just have a few lines of code to define a machine learning model. And so you can, it can do what we've done, regression and classification. Regression is fitting a line through a series of data points. Classification is sorting things into categories like images. You can make wide and deep nets. I think we've made 
some somewhat deep nets. I don't think we've made any wide nets. We talked about them a couple chapters ago. And it has these fancy features we talked about in the last couple of weeks, batch normalization, which um, adjusts the scale of each layer so that no one layer predominates controlling the output. Dropout, where you randomly ignore certain neurons in each cycle, which turns out to be a very effective way of regularization, forcing your model to learn from the general trend of the data instead of overlearning to the specific noise in your training data. And uh, learning rate schedules we talked about where if you're doing uh, gradient descent, instead of taking little steps and taking you a lot of steps to get somewhere, you can vary the size of the steps according to various schedules to try to move quickly when things are getting better fast and move slower when you're near the bottom and you're trying to find the exact bottom. So this is usually what you need for almost all machine learning cases, and that's the point. The easy API, Keras, gives you the most common machine learning features, which are usually what you want, but sometimes they aren't good enough, and then you want the full power of the, the library, and that's the TensorFlow's low-level Python API. So now you can customize everything. You can use, um, I remember I was sort of surprised when I started, you have like two or three choices of lost functions, and what if you have others? You can make any lost function you want, or metric, We'll talk about them. You can customize the layers, the models, the initializers, the regularizers, the weights, and anything else. You, know, you can just make a custom model that is not one of the standard most common type of models, and of course that'll be necessary for certain problems. So TensorFlow, I was confused when I started doing these projects. I jumped right into hands-on, and I wanted to customize the code, and I had a lot of problem moving data types around. But TensorFlow is very close to um, a math library, uh, the one mentioned up here, NumPy, which I'd used a little bit before. These are both just models that let you handle do numerical computation. And TensorFlow specifically works on tensors, and tensors are essentially arrays, although they can be arrays in high dimensions. And there is some complicated mathematical specialty about tensors. I used to know it many years ago when I was in physics, but I can't remember it anymore or understand it. There's some reason why only certain arrays are tensors. But for our purposes in machine learning, you can just think of them as arrays in perhaps a high number of dimensions, just like a grid or a cube or a hypercube full of uh, elements containing numbers. So um, this was developed by Google Brain, and it's being used to power many Google services. And it's been open source for years. So this is the most widely used deep learning library in the industry. So you know that's why I was surprised when I proposed to teach this course over um, Christmas to a bunch of teachers. They said, are you following the IBM machine learning course model? And I'm like, there's an IBM machine learning course. I better take a look at that. When I looked at it, it's exactly the same thing. So I think everybody, there is sort of a standard machine learning training curriculum, and we're following it. I guess this textbook follows it. Um, there's not a certification or anything yet, but there do seem to be a pretty standard set of lessons and concepts you want to get. So this is like NumPy, but it supports GPU, and it also supports distributed computing. So you can have a cluster of computers all working together on a big problem. And of course, that's necessary for a really big problem like a large language model. Uh, it has a just-in-time compiler, which is a wonderful thing. So you can write in a high-level language like Python, but it will compile stuff to make it really fast, yeah, which is what you want to do. Um, then it, you can extract the computation graph, which we'll talk about, and it will optimize it, and then you can export it to other environments. You can train it in Python on Linux and then run it in Java on Android, which is just what's happening. There are now these uh, AI models that run on your cell phone, and they are not just sending API requests to a server. They're actually doing the machine learning on your phone. They aren't training machine learning, which is a big task. They are just running a pre-trained model on your phone. And a pre-trained model on your phone just amounts to taking the inputs, multiplying them by the weights, going through a few layers. And it's all very fast if you have a GPU or something and uh, can run on a phone from battery power. So uh, it also has reverse mode auto diff we talked about, which is the wonderful thing that makes any of this possible by calculating how much every weight is contributing to the loss so you can tell which direction will lower the loss so now you can perform gradient descent without having to do a grid search across an impossible number of parameters and dimensions. You just figure out with a small number of calculations which direction will improve the model and you take a step in that direction. So with a modest amount of calculation you can get to the bottom. <coughs> Sands has an AI applied machine learning, data science and machine learning. Oh good, about search. It's not the content that's great. 
to just a shirt. That's good. I'm glad to hear about it. Although I must say, I would not recommend having a machine learning shirt at this point because it's all changing so fast. Like I was telling you in the news segment, I, I read an article a month ago about how to make your own large language model and train it to do Shakespeare. And by the time I get to write it up, it's already obsolete because OpenAI has made a much easier way to do the same thing. So realistically, I think if you had a cert now, you'd have to update it a lot. But anyway, maybe it exists. Uh, of course, I think the fundamental thing like what we're teaching, learning in this course hasn't changed. These are all the developments over maybe the last 10 years that led to this. All right, then we have optimizers. We've talked about these before, various ways to optimize the learning process. So this is a summary of the Python API. You've got, um, it's Keras is the high-level API. This is the low-level API, gf.nn. You've got autodiff, which we'll talk about. This is what's used for um, reverse mode uh, finding gradient, reverse mode autodiff. Um, you have a tape, which is like a tape recorder, where you record the contribution of the various weights to what you're doing, so you can use that to do the derivative and calculate uh, which way to step down. You have mathematics math, uh, random numbers, bitwise calculations, and so on. You have I.O. and pre-processing. Um, all right, so I wonder if this, oh, it's too big. It's on fit, huh? All right, what's the deal here? All right, we got TensorBoard. Guess my picture is a little too big. All right, that's for visualizing models. You got things to deploy your model, to save it, and so on. You got special data structures. We'll talk about these later and other things. So that's the sort of stuff you see in an API. Not enormously complicated. So there are kernels. Kernels are the specific implementations. How random is random? Haha, <laughs> a very good question, Jordan, and I don't know the answer. Uh, this has led to a lot of problems, but there are random numbers that aren't truly random. Uh, it's a very good question, and I think you're very wise to be suspicious because I think the only use of random numbers in machine learning is to do things like randomize the initial parameters, and so it probably would be good enough to have a sleazy random number generator that's not really cryptographically perfect for things like generating a random uh, key. There's a lot of, probably just good enough to be a, like a video game. So it's a very good question. And I don't have a good answer. All right, so this has kernels for implementation on different hardware. CPUs are the old fashioned processing units that can only do one or maybe four things at a time. Um, GPUs are the graphics processing units, which are designed to do 3D graphics for video games, and therefore they have an enormous number of parallel processors that do things like integer arithmetic really fast. You can calculate all the locations of pixels that are rotating in 3D, and therefore wonderful for machine learning. You have you can do many simple calculations all fast, and the fastest of all are tensor processing units, which are specifically designed just for machine learning, sort of a super GPU. So. They are custom ASIC chips. ASIC means application-specific integrated circuits, and I've known about these for years. I first learned about them for Bitcoin mining. All the cryptocurrency miners would get, first they started running them on normal computers, then they ran them on GPUs, and then as the Bitcoin price rose, they would get special chips designed just to do this one calculation as fast as possible, and that was much more calculation per second for the same amount of money. So this is the natural progression. You start with a general purpose computer, then you go to a graphic processing unit, which is only good for things that can be highly parallelized, but it's very fast. And then you go to special chips designed just for this one task you're doing. Um, Cloudflare's entropy. Yeah, they've all of Lava Labs. Yes, absolutely. You're quite correct. Uh, the quality of random number generators matters a lot. If you're trying to do something like make a private key for cryptography, it might not matter that much if you're just trying to have random starting points for something that's going to do a gradient descent. All right, so here's the architecture. You have your code. Your code goes through the Keras or Data API if you want to write in Python, and or through low-level Python here. And then it goes to the execution engine to be run either on your machine or on distributed network of machines, and those could be using CPUs, GPUs, or TPUs. And there are other languages that you could be using here, like C++ and Java. All right, you can even write JavaScript models that supposedly can run the model directly in a browser. And I guess this makes sense. If you can run a model on a cell phone, you don't need much processing. So I guess you can uh, probably do the whole thing in the browser in JavaScript. All right. And so you got TensorBoard to visualize the output, as we'll see, make a sort of flow diagram of your, your model. And you can productionize products with TensorFlow Extended. Uh, TensorFlow Extended. This will 
validate the data, pre-process it, do the analysis, and set up a server to serve out the results of the model. So I think the point is you can set up your own server to be like OpenAI's server where you make API requests to that server. And then there's TensorFlow Hub, which is their website to download and reuse pre-trained neural networks to make a server, which is very good as you get to be a large company and have large deployments of these models, which I guess happens pretty fast. You know, one of my new consulting gigs is I'm helping plan a deployment of machine learning models at a uh, corporation, and I'm surprised how complicated it's getting really fast. I think they're going to have a server serving out a lot of these things. It's, so it's uh, it could be more modest. You could have to have a machine learning model that runs, say, on a cell phone and make an app, and then people will download the app and run it. But yeah, as you can imagine, uh, it gets complicated pretty fast. Tell us what kind of data is going to the model. This one here, um, the one I'm working on is going to take photographs people are snapping, and it's supposed to parse those photographs and detect items. And it's going to take um, voice commands from the user. And the idea is you have a worker out in the field working on sort of industrial equipment, and they have gloves on, and it's noisy, and it's mad dirty, and they don't really want to be like trying to tap on a tablet and type in things. They want to give it voice commands and just take a snapshot of what they got, and they want a machine learning to figure out what's going on from that. It's just far more practical than just having a, uh, a worker in a messy field trying to, uh, trying to talk to this computer stuff. So yeah, we'll see how well it works. Um, my contribution to the risk analysis people were just worried about the data getting lost in transit. And my, my contribution was, well, what about if it gives them the wrong answers? You know, there was a news article, I didn't mention it today, that they tested to see how much do AI models, large language models, hallucinate. And the very best one is GPT-4 that just makes up lies 3% of the time. And the worst is the Google models that make up lies 27% of the time. So I said, you know, the most likely risk here is it's going to just give them the wrong answer. <laughs> and then what will happen if they get told the wrong answer and do the wrong thing? That seems like that could be bad. <laughs> anyway, um, there are attempts to lower the rate of hallucinations. Uh, almost every security measure to improve uh, machine learning models happens with just another machine learning model. You have another one looking at the output of the first one, trying to see if it lied, asking the question again a different way to verify it. That seems to be the general solution for everything. Uh, you make machine learning, and then you just have more layers of machine learning, like fixing the errors in the first one, which I must say is is a very common scientific technique. You you run something through some kind of filter, and then you just have layers of filter to do a better job. Um, all right. Anyway, so NumPy is the mathematical library. So like I say, a tensor is similar to an array. So you can define import TensorFlow, then you can define a constant, and it's just, you tune an array, an array of arrays is all you do, or a list of lists is what I'd say this is. So you just have a list of numbers, and you put a decimal point in them to make them floating points. So you have one, two, three, and four, five, six. So there you are, just showing up sort of an array. You have a two by three grid of numbers. And this shows you the shape is a property, is two by three, and the data type is a property. These are 32-bit floating values. So that's all it is. Uh, and these are the quantities you manipulate in machine learning. So you can refer to them by index. You can refer to, say, T00. Now, if you go back here, T00 is 1, T11 is 5, and so on. So here's T00 and T11. It's 1 and a 5. Um, and uh, here you can print T colon means everything in that row and everything from the first column to the end. It's starting at 0. So this will cut the left column out and give you two, three, five, six. So this is how you index portions of an array. Um, at is matrix multiplication, which if you haven't taken any linear algebra or anything, you may not be used to this, but there's a way to multiply these things together. Here you can just add 10 to it. So that's just adding 10 to every cell. So 1, 2, 3 turned into 10, 11, 12. Here you're squaring it. That's just squaring every value. So instead of 1, 2, 3, you have 1, 4, 9. And here's where you multiply it by its transpose and that gives you a 2x2 two two array, which is a useful mathematical operation for some sophisticated mathematical processes. But if you're not, uh, if you're not familiar with things like transposing or matrix multiplication, it doesn't really matter for what we're doing here. But that's what's used for certain operations, like 3D rotations and certain mathematical calculations uh, in, inside some of these models. But the big thing that always irritates me in every Python project, including this one, is type conversions. 
Um, and you, you could automatically convert types, but it turns out converting data from one type to another is an expensive operation, so they don't. So here, if I take 1 plus 2, and I take constant 1 plus constant 2, that will work. The answer is, of course, 3. But if I take 1.0 plus 2, it will crash and spit out a bunch of error messages because I tried to add floating point to integer, which doesn't seem like it's asking for too much. But here it tells you cannot convert um, a float tensor, but it's an int tensor. So, you know, because I think the tensor might be really big, it might be 100 dimensions, uh, they, you know, how hard would it be to convert an integer to a float? Well, remember, your tensor might be really big. That might be a really big job, so they don't want you accidentally writing code that mixes types. They want to make you aware of it, so you really think about how much CPU you're wasting mixing types. So that's a thing to be aware of. Um, and so cast is how you convert things to another. You can take um, the constant 2, and you can cast it to 32-bit float. And now it will match 1.0, and now you can add 1 and 2 and get 3.0. So they just want to make sure you do this consciously and deliberately, and you don't just accidentally imply it in one line of your code and then wonder why the thing runs much slower than it should. All right, another thing about it is these constant is kind of a clue. These are immutable. Now you can replace the whole... Now I was surprised. They said it was immutable, so I thought this stuff would not work. T plus 10, but it does work. Even though the tensor is itself immutable, what um, you can set t equals t plus 10, and it will work because it creates a new tensor for t plus 10 and overwrites the first one. So you can replace the whole thing by a new tensor, but you can't change one element of the tensor because it's immutable. So you did 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. If you try to assign 3 to the first area where there's a 1, It'll print it out like I told it to, but now it crashes again with a bunch of error messages saying, this Python tensor has no attribute assigned. Well, that's true, but what you have to do is instead of defining it to be a constant tensor, you define it to be a variable tensor. And now you can have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and you can assign 3 at the top left, and it turns into 3, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. And this is almost always what you want, of course, because the whole point of machine learning is you have all these, this thing is all full of weights, and as you do your gradient descent, you keep changing all those weights. So you totally want to do a lot of operations like this, where you change the value of one of these things. Um, and so you use variable tensors. There's a lot of other data structures. There's sparse tensors, which store more efficiently because the tensors are mostly zeros. We've talked about this. You can often, many tasks can be done where most of the parameters are zero. And that, of course, makes them smaller and faster to use. You can have tensor arrays. Uh, you can have ragged tensors, which is a list of tensors that are not all the same shape. They are larger or smaller along certain dimensions, and so it's not going to form a nice column. If you were to line them up on paper, it'll make a ragged column, and they call those the ragged dimensions, the dimension along which the size of it varies. String tensors contain strings. I was surprised to see this. The strings are old-fashioned C and Python 2 strings. They are byte strings, not Unicode. I have no idea why they did that, maybe to make it faster, but that's a blaster in the past. Boy, I was used to that my whole life, and it must have taken me three or four years of working with Python 3 to get over it. Um, and I became a total advocate of believing that strings really should be a series of Unicode characters and not a series of bytes, but uh, TensorFlow is a step backwards. <laughs> uh, then you have sets. Sets are a special Python data type. They're like lists, but they don't allow duplicates. And there's queues, which I've never heard of in Python before. If they exist, I've never used them, where you can have a list of objects, and there is some kind of order to those objects. And you can define various orders. There's first in, first out. Uh, there's queues that prioritize certain items. You can shuffle the items. You can batch items and pad them. So uh, I'm not entirely sure under what circumstances you want to use this, but the data type exists, so there must be some reason to use queues in machine learning. Uh, it's not incredibly obvious to me why, although I can sort of guess if you wanted to do batch processing of data. I could imagine a situation where you have a data that consists of a small amount of high quality data and a large amount of noisier data. And so I want to make batches that always include like half of the good data and a random half of the bad data or something like that. So I can, I can sort of imagine situations where this might be a helpful construct. Anyway, let's try a Kahoot. And I've got it here. Thank you. 
Under string tensors would be relevant. Working with something like smart contract byte code. Yes, possibly. Yeah. Makes sense to me, working with some other kind of data. And a series of bytes might just be the most general way to encode any kind of data. <laughs> All right, let's give it a shot. All right, so which hardware is the slowest? Yep, CPU, the old-fashioned processor can only do one thing at a time, or these days maybe a few things at a time, but nothing compared to a GPU or a TPU. All right, what language allows the models to run directly in the browser? This would make a fun project, if I can find out how to do this, see how fast it really runs. JavaScript is much faster. The whole modern web was started about 10 years ago when Google and Mozilla decided to make JavaScript faster, and it turned out that Microsoft's IE was running JavaScript at only like 1 100th of the speed it could run at, and they made it much faster, and that created the new web where almost every web page is just vast amounts of JavaScript. All right, how do you convert one data type to another? Something I seem to spend about half my time doing in Python projects. That's a cast, same thing as it is in C. All right. All right, what data structure includes tensors with varying sizes? Those are ragged tensors. All right. Oops, and ant ignore. And Greg. All right. All right, so uh, here's the kind of things you might want to do with this low level API. You might want a custom loss function. Now, this is something that's actually available in Keras, but I'll just show you how to do it. We talked about the Huber loss. Uh, the most common loss that goes all the way back, like I said, 50 years ago when I used to fit curves, was mean squared error. That has all kinds of good mathematical properties, but that means a large error from one point is counted much more than a small error, and you might not want that. For that, you've got absolute error, and you might combine the two. So here you can just take the absolute error and the square error and combine them. Here you uh, add them together in some mathematical way so you can make a custom error message which is in fact already available called Huber but you could make your own Huber and you could define any kind of loss function that might shoot you for a specific problem and you could customize the activation functions the initializers regularizers and constraints the activation functions are what takes the output of the signal from the neuron and calculates uh, what kind of number to pass on to the next level which is directly after the activation function in human neurons that take the percentage of uh, neurotransmitters in the cell and, and you calculate how much uh, electrical signal to send down the axon. So here you can have, uh, for example, an exponential function. That's one of them. Uh, here you can have an initializer that initializes them according to a pattern. And we talked about this before. You, uh, this is the Glorod initializer that initializes weights uh, at a good value so that the model will learn efficiently. Um, and here's a regularizer that will um, prevent the model doing overfitting and smooth out the answers. And this is one that will shrink, I think it's the one that shrinks it by 1% on every cycle to just try to make the weights get small. Uh, one of the common regularization techniques is to just try to avoid having a huge steep slope on any particular weight. And here's a value that uh, 
will return a positive value on the weights. I'm not quite sure what the point is. Constraint, okay. Return value is just uh, ReLU, okay. Right, this is um, rectified linear. So this is just the thing that if it's less than zero, it puts out zero. And if it's greater than zero, it puts out an unchanged value. So it is the simplest uh, rectification. You remember the in the real neurons, you pretty much have a step function where you have a threshold. And if it's below the threshold, you put out nothing. If it's above the threshold, you put out a signal that doesn't depend on the input. But for machine learning, it's better above the threshold to have a increasing signal that increases with the input so there is a gradient and now you can do gradient descent. And so after you define these special things, here's how you use them. You just tell it, use this activation function instead of the default one, use this initializer, regularizer, and constraint. You just specify them when you call it, define your layer to use these special functions. So it's pretty easy to do. You can have custom metrics. Now losses are what's used to train a model. And this is something I've seen go by in a lot of these projects without really understanding it. So the loss is the thing you minimize, the the measurement of how good your model is and you want it to be small. So that's gradient descent. Um, now the loss can be any weird calculation you want. The simplest one is just the mean squared error, but it could be whatever suits your model. And it might be something complicated and difficult for humans to understand. But a metric is used to announce how good it is at the end. And that should be something simple a human can understand. So you can define the metrics here to do whatever you like, and you use that Huber metric, which is just a combination of the absolute error and the mean squared error. And so you can make custom layers. You can, there are layers without weights, like flatten or relu, that um, change the input to the output, but they don't have any adjustment or weights. And so here's one that just applies an exponential function to the input, so you could take the exponential of something coming in. I don't know when you would want to do that. More often, you'd want to calm things down by taking a logarithm. But in principle, you could do it, and you could do anything you like. You define these with lambda functions. And then you can make custom stateful layers. Now, the other layers are non-stateful layers without weights. Um, there's nothing to adjust about them. They just transform the data. But stateful layers have weights that are going to be adjusted as you perform training. So here you can make a, a model of the dense layer. You make your dense layer. And this will uh, build it. And I just look through your general things. You initialize it with Glorot. And somewhere, there's going to be the property that it has to connect every neuron in the previous layer to every neuron in this layer. And that's probably implied something here with batch input shape or something. I, I don't quite understand it. And I highly recommend, by the way, this sleazy way of thinking I'm doing. But especially when learning something that is under development and changing really fast, like machine learning, rather than struggling to get every little detail of what's going on now, just get a general overview. This was very hard for me to learn when I came from the world of mathematics and physics, where you had to know 100% of chapter one before you went to chapter two. And then I got into like security and even management, where you can't do that at all. Instead, you need to get the lay of the land, a general idea of what's going on here. And then you can decide what part you want to focus on and what part is not worth wasting your time on. So like I say, just know it can be done. You can make custom layer and get a general idea how it works. And here's an example of a custom model you might have. You have a dense layer here, the kind we've been using. Then you have something called a residual block. And you're going to run that three times. And then another residual block and another dense layer. And the residual block is one of these wide models, wide and deep, where you have one path where it goes through two dense layers. And then you're going to combine it with just a copy of the input. So you're going to have some input that runs past here. And like I say, this might look like madness. But you know, in a simple case, you might have certain items of data which are fine the way they are, and other items of data which require more processing, and you want them all combined in one model. So you have uh, this, I think, we even applied to that job of uh, categorizing the numbers, the digits, handwritten digits. Because there are probably some pixels, like the ones in the corner, where if you see this pixel bright, that means it can't be a 1 or a 2. It's got to be an 8 or something. But we have that corner used. So you don't really need to do much processing. That one pixel gives you valuable information. But other pixels have to be run through these models to try to find the curve and decide where the curve is and stuff. So you can imagine this might be good. And then you'd uh, this is a complicated model. It's not a single pass through at all. It's got bypasses, and it's got repetition and cycles. So that's an example of a custom model you might want. And you can do that. Like, here's the residual block layer. This is the kind of Python I hate. Instead of making a for loop, obviously, you have an implied for loop. So you make your hidden layer, have a dense layer, and then you put a for at the end. So it's going to be a series of n layers. This is what makes this structure here a series of layers. Um, 
All right. And then you can make a residual regressor, which will train that thing. And see, here it is doing, uh, you have a dense layer with 30 neurons here. Then you have a residual block of two layers of 30 and another residual block with two layers of 30 in the output. And that's the game. So this is generally how you set up that complicated model, which we haven't got anything like this in our hands-on projects right now. All we have are models with maybe three or four layers just in a nice sequence. But uh, Python code does support making these complicated models if you need them. All right, and so uh, you can also define losses and metrics based on something complicated. If you don't have something simple like mean squared error, uh, you normally base them on labels and predictions. You predict something, you see how close you were to, to the results, but you can do other things. You can include weight or activation of hidden layers, um, and this might be regularization. It might also be useful to monitor an inter internal aspect of your model. And I mentioned in the news a couple weeks ago, there are companies that specialize just in describing machine learning models. You have a model, and now they want to be able to say what each neuron and each layer is doing. So by uh, some technique, perhaps like this, they actually try to determine a understandable explanation of what the different layers are doing, which is essentially what a lot of people did back when I was doing human brain research. They would do analysis of the firing of the signals in the brain and then have people do tasks. And they would try to say, this part of the brain has emotion, this part of the brain has vision, this part of the brain detects motion, and things like that. And, uh, you know, it's kind of, uh, you can argue whether it's science or what it is. It's, it's trying to take something very complicated and trying to boil it down to comprehensible pieces so we can work with it. And it all started with, I think, experiments in the Civil War where they had people that had been shot in the head, and they would then recover, and they were able to see what part of their uh, abilities had been lost by having damage in different parts of the brain. And they began to realize the brain really is divided into a set of organs. This organ does speech, this organ does higher thought, and so on. To some extent, that's true. And to another extent, it's not true, because even after damage to the brain, you can recover a lot of function by training other neurons to take over that function. So anyway, uh, both in the real brain and in neural networks, this is currently a really hard problem, explaining how it works and therefore understanding how to get better control over it. And of course, auto diff, which we talked about. Reverse mode auto diff is what calculates the gradient, and it does this by using a structure called a gradient tape that records every operation involving a variable so it can then do calculated derivative on it later and help you decide which direction you should take a step in. And you can force it to watch other things than the usual thing and can therefore extend this uh, reverse mode auto diff to whatever uh, conditions of your more complicated model may apply. And then there's custom training loops. Um, here's a wide and deep model. Like we said before, you have a deep model that goes through several layers and you have a wide model that just cuts to the end without modifying the data. But the fit method we've been using only does one optimizer. And in this model, you'd have to define a custom optimizer to define uh, exactly how you're going to take a step in such a complicated situation. All right, and then, of course, there's a the visualization, which is actually pretty interesting. And I wonder if this is how other visualizers work, like the one in Ida Pro. I never thought about it before. But what it does is to make the graph, first it analyzes your Python source code, and it rewrites it in simpler terms using special functions. So it captures the control flow statements. And the point of that is to make this block diagram, while loop, range, and such. So it breaks your set up your code into blocks of, of statements, and then it runs it with tracing. This runs through that modified code, which does not bother doing any calculation. It just figures out where it might go in order to draw the arrows. So it does the autograph to find the blocks, and it does the tracing to find the arrows. And then you have this sort of block diagram model, which I've seen in many software products, helping in reverse engineering. And uh, that's interesting. So anyway, that's how it actually does this function of creating graph graphical presentations of your models. So. Let's try another Kahoot, which is going to be this one. Thank you. 
right. Looks like we're only getting four. All right, so which one of these must be easily interpreted by humans? Metrics are intended to communicate to humans how good it is, so it should be a number that can be understood. All right, what is a stateful layer? Stateful layers have these weights that can be adjusted. That's where the learning takes place. All right, and which, how do you find the control flow statements? That's called autograph. Okay, good. And ignore is one twice. And XC wins. Good. So. And Greg is one twice. All right. Good. 